You're listening to To Hatch a Pod with Key Budge and Greg Garrett. Welcome back to To Hatch a Pod. I'm Key Budge. Greg Garrett joins me today. Greg, how are you? I'm good, Key. How about yourself? I'm doing really good. It's a little bit different because Corey's not here. I'm not used to not having Corey you know, joining us in the podcast. Maybe we'll be a little more productive in getting the information out. I'm not sure. One of us will well, have to The comedian br- is always there trying w- to come out, right? I was going to say one of us is going to have to bring the funny today since Corey's not here. Yeah, That's it's, what not he you, it's not you or I, though. <laughs> <laughs> today, we're going to talk about projects that are about to take place or, or have started here in our city limits. I'm super excited. We're going to have Don Marsh, our public works director, and Andrew, associate engineer with the city of Tatchby. They work really well together. And Key, we have over $4 million worth of improvements that we're going to be doing on our city streets this summer. That's a lot of money and it's I think a lot it's of a projects. Record. I think it's a record. It's a lot of money and we're putting it to good use. Your tax dollars are being put to good use on the streets and roads. Okay, that's all coming up in just a minute. Let's recap what happened in our most recent council meeting. We haven't done that in a while. You want to share anything with the community about the things that uh, took place? There were a couple of things that were addressed. Yeah, super excited. We're meeting in person now at the BK Theater. So reminder, every Monday, every first and third Monday of the month, 6 o'clock, BK Theater. We own the theater, and we partner with TCT, Touch Be Community Theater, but we're utilizing that facility now for our, our city council meetings. It was nice to be back in person. We had a couple items. We were looking for a new TVRPD representative for the uh, Parks District that represents the city, and different various things. But always, we post that on YouTube if you'd like to watch the meeting. So please do that and join us if you have time. We'd love to have you. It was nice to be in person. There was audience members that that had come. And then I think the council, most importantly, that's the feedback that they said. It's just, oh my gosh, it's nice to see other people and to be in this setting. I was surprised how many people were in the audience. There was probably 20 or more people that were in the audience. It was super nice to see people and, and being engaged with their, with their process, their government process locally. And I think when... I, and this is just a, a wild thought, but I think people that attend maybe the council meetings see what's in the BK if they've never been there before. That might bring them back for TCT and open them up for what their summer plans are. Let's hope they do. It's a beautiful facility. Well, let's get right to the meat of what we're here for today. We've got Don Marsh, our public works director. Don, welcome to Tatchpot again. Thank you. Glad to be back. And Andrew Norton, our associate engineer here at the city of Tehachapi. Andrew, welcome back. You also are a returning guest. Yeah, thanks, Key. Greg, this is one thing that you, was very important for you that you wanted to bring this topic to the table and thought it's time for the public to, to understand what we've got fired up, the irons that are in the fire right now. Thank you, Key. As I mentioned before, I wanted to get Don and Andrew in the room and talk about how we collaborate well together because Andrew Norton, our associate engineer, he's designing, engineering, managing these projects, your tax dollars, and then Don Marsh will maintain them at some point. And so... We have over $4 million worth of tax dollars that are hitting the streets of the city of Tehachapi. And I'd like to just go down that list. So, Andrew, maybe you could just start us on the list and tell us what's going on this summer. Sure, sure. We just buttoned up the rail corridor project, which are the three railroad crossings here in town. That was a $1.8 million project and enhanced H Street, did fencing and trees and asphalt pavement along the railroad tracks. That was a super exciting project, Andrew. We redid Green Street Crossing, the uh, Hay Street Crossing, Denison Road Crossing, and we want to thank everybody for their patience. We had to work with Union Pacific, so the crossings are smoother, they're safer, they're wider, pedestrian enhancements, all those sorts of things. And working with Union Pacific is kind of like working with the IRS, right? You pick up the phone, let's be honest, and, and it's really tough to to manage uh, our way through that. So kudos to you and, and your team. Is it a team of one? Is that you or how does <laughs> no. that work? I, I know we have inspectors, Jason White and others that are helping. Right, absolutely. Obviously, um, and Denise with contracts and those sorts of things. But that was a big push. That was a big push. I do have to give a special thanks to the local Union Pacific track team. They really kind of helped out a lot in regards to picking up the phone and being there mm-hmm. when we needed it. There was quite a bit of landscaping done on that project as well. The cedar trees along H Street. So those will be Dawn's to maintain here Mm -hmm. in a month or so for for forever. And the fencing looks so nice. It it really looks pleasing to the eye and it's safer. I've said this a couple times. We have a photo actually of a of a young mom pushing a stroller across the railroad tracks east of the of the depot. And that really was the impetus to start this project. Like we got to do something. This trespassing thing is is not good, the safety aspect. So that's when we started looking at grants 
to be able to uh, allow us to do this project. Yeah, that, that was a good project, and and I'm glad it's buttoned up. Right. Yeah. And people are using it. I've seen people in wheelchairs. I've seen the moms in pushing the strollers that are using the sidewalk, the cyclists, and just the safety aspect. I sat the other day and just kind of watched some people crossing as I saw pedestrians out, and I go, it's nice to see something that was built as you you engineer it for the use. And I know, Andrew, you've talked about that. It's kind of like you, when you some things are designed, it's to encourage proper use or crossings of you know something that's potentially dangerous. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it was super nice to almost include Darlene's in those stores that are you know used to be on the other side of a tracks where it was a barrier to mobility and and drag those pretty easily to to downtown almost. Mm-hmm. And, you know, you talk about, you said cyclist a moment ago, you know, this project really ties into the bike path there at Hayes. And it goes all the way out to Loves. And we have been creating, designing, and building a bike path system network in the city and beyond with the county's uh, assistance and Golden Hill CSD. We've, we've created this bike path slash pedestrian paths that people are using for either transportation or recreation and really excited about that network also. I will say that in working with Andrew during this project, he would tell me that because there it's Union Pacific, there was different crews that were involved and you had to work around their schedule, which kind of made it, a, I don't want to say a challenge, maybe the challenge is the right word. Yeah, absolutely. But it was one of those things that they'd kind of tell you, hey, we're not going to be there next week. We're going to be in Omaha and uh, we'll be there in three weeks. And then you'd have to adjust closings to go around the schedule of Union Pacific to bring in this special crew that laid the crossing. They bring it in prefabbed or do they make it here? No, they, one team, it was called the track team, uh, built those pretty much on site and had the specialized equipment to be able to lift the rails. And, you know, they park actually their equipment on the rails and were able to lift it, slide the new concrete panels that they fabricated here on site, slide them under, and then bop on down. The other team was the signal team. They placed all the new crossing arms and the new signal arms. And, and then we had also CPUC, which is California Public Utilities Commission, folded in there as well. So, so Andrew's kind of like the orchestra maestro, an orchestra of sorts, if you will. And Don, you've got to maintain it all now, m- minus the tracks, right? So how's that going to so, go? Yeah, thanks, Andrew. Yeah. So the, bat- <laughs> the baton is about to be handed over. There you go. We just, on Monday night at the city council meeting, as a matter of fact, we uh, recorded or, or council authorized the completion of the project, right? So we'll record that and pay the contractor the remaining 10%. And now it's Don's baby, right? Minus the, the warranty work, of course. Yeah, weed control, there. tree trimming, yeah. uh, maintaining sidewalks, curb, gutter, yeah. streets. It's super important to keep it clean and safe. Yep, right? absolutely. Yeah, we're a windy town and things are moving around all the time, so it's a constant battle. In public works, we've got different departments. So how many aspects, when you take on this project, how many of your little your subcategories or your sub-departments within the public works organization now get involved in the maintenance of this project? Oh, quite a few, actually. We, we have our landscaping group that manages all of the landscaping that the city owns and maintains. And so, obviously, we just fold in the tree maintenance and the weed abatement into that. Uh, so that group manages that. And then our streets division, they take care of the, the maintenance of the streets. Any of the asphalt, sidewalks, curbs, gutters, we have to you know, keep those in good condition. So that just fills up your entire your entire department. You know, each of the subcategories, I, I call them subcategories and, and different divisions, divisions within your yeah. within the organization, they have now another list that they add to their regular schedule of maintenance. Absolutely. And we have an amazing public works department these days. We work super safe. Don, it's been a couple of years now. We've gone without uh, you know, lost time accident. We have talented people that are regularly trained, educated, and so dedicated to the city. We just really are blessed with a public works crew that gets on things every day. It's, they don't just go out and do things. They plan their day. They plan their weeks. They plan their months. And Tyler Napier, the public works uh, assistant director, he's really an integral part of that. Yeah, we've done a very good job over the years of building our capabilities And everything from, like you said, from the planning and scheduling of work to the actual trade skills that we have. And hopefully you can see that throughout town with the concrete work that we're doing all over. Basically, 
every week for the last several months, we've been doing a certain section of either curbs or driveway approaches, sidewalks, and those fingerprints are all over town. We can really see that. And uh, as well as asphalt work and improving that. And that that goes along with the projects that we're talking about here, because there's a lot of preparation, for example, when we go to pave a street, there's a lot of preparation that public works department has to do. We're improving the curbs and gutters so that we're not laying down asphalt next to a curb and gutter that's completely broken up in poor condition. So we go ahead of the, of the paving and get ready for that paving work. It really shows in the end because it, it's a very much better product. Don, that's a perfect segue. So we're getting ready to pave Davis Street this year. And that's going to be from Tehachapi Boulevard, basically up to the the Wells School Center, Central Park area. But before we pave, we've been working on some concrete work. So why don't you tell us about that? Yeah, actually, we've done a ton of work over there, uh, replacing or installing new driveway approaches at the alleys. So uh, those were just asphalt or partially asphalt, partially dirt. And uh, we have been pouring those in concrete. We have replaced a, a big section of curb and gutter on E Street right in front of the, the park and getting ready again for the, for the asphalt work that's coming up. And then we installed a new cross gutter uh, across E Street at Davis, and that really will help with drainage and help prolong the life of the new asphalt. We have a lot of water penetration into the asphalt there, the, the existing asphalt and uh, due to, to standing water at times. And uh, the, this new cross gutter will really help with the drainage and getting that water out of there. So again, doing things to help prolong and um, improve the overall product of the paving work. Well, that, that part of town is 100 plus years old. Yeah. And as you're, you're right, there's some areas where concrete or asphalt don't exist, or maybe the asphalt or concrete disappeared. And so we have a crew internally where we're saving money, saving taxpayer dollars, because when we go out for bid and we issue a contract, that's very costly. We have include Andrew's department. There's so many boxes that we must check. But if we can just form and pour in house, we're saving tax dollars. That's really an efficient way to get things done. Yeah, anytime on a limited use, scale. We can't do it on a big scale, but on a limited scale. Anytime we use contractors, that gets very expensive. Right, right. We have to pay for for travel and bringing people into town and uh, mobilization and getting equipment here, and it, it it gets very expensive fast. Absolutely. Why don't we talk about since we're talking about curb gutter sidewalks, asphalt, Andrew? Why don't we talk about the Snyder Avenue project? So Snyder Street from the Boulevard, Tachapa Boulevard, up to Valley. Why don't we talk about what's happening there? Yeah, of course. We'll start at the south end um, nearest valley. We're going ahead and widening the road out to be full width on Snyder, adding curb, gutter, and sidewalk, both sides where it's currently dirt. I think there's a three-way stop right now, or it'll become a three-way stop right there at at Valley and Snyder. Heading north, we redid, we've previously redone the Anita and Snyder intersection, so that one's in good shape. And then heading further north, C, D Street, and out in front of the Tila School Center. We're going to be redoing some curb gutter sidewalk over there. It's mainly most of the projects on the west side of the street where, as you said, the houses are 100 years old and there's no curb gutter sidewalk and it's dirt currently. So we'll add sidewalk on that side. And then we'll proceed all the way north on the west side of the road to the pretty much the Salvation Army. That's exciting. So $1.2 million taxpayer dollars, and when we're done, Snyder Avenue in front of the Monroe, Saracosa community area, all the way up past the Church of Latter-day Saints connecting to Valley Boulevard will be full width concrete, curb, gutter, sidewalks, crosswalks, and brand new asphalt by the end of the summer. Yes. That is amazing. That's going to be so nice. That's really well-traveled. It is. And, you know, speaking to Don's, this was purely grant funded, and so it's harmonizing with Don's stuff. We apply for competitive grants, but they've got to be large enough and, and on a scale to attract the scores of the grants. And so that's where I feel like public works and development services are keynoting really well is, mm-hmm. you know, Don, don't worry about this section. We're, we're applying for a grant and, and hopefully that becomes something, you know, nice. And so then it frees up Don's crews to be able to go and address a, an individual alley approach. Because as you said, it's pretty expensive to go to bid, but 
on these larger projects, if they're grant funded and, and fully funded through grants, then it, it really keynotes. Well. This, super this was a great project. Also, we really worked together well. The curb gutter and sidewalk was, was kind of in the queue and planned. The, the grant had been approved and public works had already identified Snyder as really a street that needs to be repaved. And so we kind of worked together and said, hey, is there any way we can kind of work these projects together and maybe find some grant money? And it just worked out great for us. The grant funding kind of fell into place and then the timing worked out perfect as well. So we're just going to do one right after the other. We're going to end up with a with a beautiful project afterwards. You mean that we have different departments within the city that talk together Imagine and that, work together? Right? <laughs> I, you know, I've worked for uh, different government agencies, and the communication usually doesn't flow very well. But what I've seen here within our city is very strong communication. To see you guys work on a project, and we're talking the figure of $1.2 million, that's significant. And when you guys look about trying to benefit each other, hey, how can we work together as a team to benefit the community? That's a big deal. It is a big deal. And I don't know if it was clear or not to the listener, but there are actually two grants here. One for the curb gutter sidewalk, and there's a separate grant for the asphalt, the street, the paving. And so we choreographed that also so that that would flow together. We hope the same contractor potentially gets the same because we would save mobilization costs and those sorts of things. But two pots of money from two different agencies for two different reasons, and it is, I'll remind everybody, competitive. We don't just get this money. You may or may not like the grant process that takes place, but it's a competitive process. We're competing with our neighbors uh, regionally and statewide for this money, and we have to prove to the agency that we deserve it, we, we need it, we can deliver, and we can maintain it. Otherwise, they stop giving you the money because they know you're not, you're not serious, and we are serious, and that's why we've got over $4 million this year because we can do all that. And then yesterday I came by Andrew's office, and he was being audited. And it was the third or fourth time this month. You know, People want to know that you're spending. You have to prove to them that you're spending the money in the appropriate way. If you're not, they pull back. Well, guess what? We do, and we prove that we... We did, in this case, and we always will, spend the money in the appropriate way, following the rules. Let me add to that, because that's a lot of things that I learned, you know, being Joe Citizen, you know, is that with the grant, some people think that, oh, you were awarded a million dollar grant for X project. Here's a million dollars. Yeah, not the case. That's not the way it works. Mm -hmm. And like you said, there's so many rules in place that have to be followed. You have to make sure that meticulously you go through that list of requirements in order to make sure they fund it at the end and the funding comes at the end of the project is that is that correct or well it, it, we, I, we I guess every agency would be different estimates but but the point is really if our budget wasn't healthy we couldn't front pay these contractors and then get reimbursed later it could be months and months and months that's not right andrew yeah exactly yeah and when we're talking about you know, the rail corridor was $1.8 million. The Snyder Project, $1.2 million. That's $3 million that our general fund has to front and pay the contractor and then ask for reimbursement later. And that money is not just wired that day, right? It takes sometimes months to get that money. And then they make sure that you've gone through and followed all the protocols that are put in place in order to fund it. Yeah, so we invoice Caltrans, and then they essentially audit every line to make sure there's no math errors, and then they ship it off to you know either the grant agency or, or Sacramento, and then, then we're issued payment back. Right, and some people think, you said Caltrans just now, I think some people think, well, they just maintain the freeway. Well, no, no, no. They are the keeper of almost all the funds when it comes to the state of California and also through the federal government. So we utilize and work with Caltrans very closely and respect what they do because they're part, they're integral part of this process that we that we go through. Most most federal grant funds are shepherded by Caltrans, right. so you report to Caltrans, and then the feds reserve the right to come on at you. But. I, I think there are a lot more than people realize. You know, you see the workers on the side of the road. That's a tiny piece of what they do, and it's important to make sure that tax dollars are being spent correctly. You know, this is one of those things that you look back and it's like, I know that audits can be tedious, but you, when you do everything right, it flows through. But I want to make sure that these things are being checked and making sure that 
money by agencies is being spent appropriately because it is our tax dollars being used to strengthen our infrastructure and rebuild it. That's right. So we are going to be repaving Davis and Green Street, also Andrew and, and Don. So tell us about those two streets. Yeah, so this one's not publicly funded or grant funded. It's it's funded through Don's department, so I appreciate him you know, handing so us. So Don's budget is healthy enough, too, that we can do this internally. That's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> We, we actually Not that I just found out about this, right? I've, we've been planning this for a while. We've actually developed a pavement management plan that goes out a number of years. And so we, we kind of have a forecast of where we're going to be doing paving projects over the next several years. And Davis and Green Streets are next. Green Street is a, a very highly traveled road, particularly north of the railroad tracks, but even downtown and south of Tatchby Boulevard to C Street, those streets, like you said before, are 100 years old. There has been not a lot of maintenance done on them over the years, and so this will be a good opportunity to to get those into a good good condition. So Green Street on the north side of the tracks, if I recall, we not long ago put curb, gutter, sidewalk. So we framed it in, and we knew that we were hoping to be able to either fund internally or get grant money to repave Green Street. So basically from the airport gate... All the way to the railroad tracks, we will be repaving. And then from, if we cross over to Hatchaby Boulevard, from the boulevard going south through the downtown area to E Street, we'll be repaving and or slurry ceiling and doing some, some maintenance work there. That's exactly correct. Yeah, That's and awesome. we'll be doing some work ahead of time. Again, in preparation for that, there's some curb and gutter on the west side of green street north of the tracks that we'll be doing some rebuilding of over the next couple weeks in preparation for this work this is also a good project we don't have the in-house capabilities to do a major paving project like this ourselves however we will be doing some of the work to help reduce the cost we're going to be doing some things like traffic control for the contractors we'll be doing that in-house with our, our public works staff. We'll be setting up and tearing down traffic control. We also are going to be doing things like rebuilding the, the manhole covers and valve cans. So in the street, there are there's manholes, obviously, for sewer access, and then there's valve cans that uh, access water valves. And we'll be doing that work ourselves in preparation for the, the paving. And then there's some work that we have to do afterwards as well. Just, again, to help be more efficient with our contractor costs and reduce the overall cost of the project. So it's not just repaving with the, like a manhole cover. It's surrounded by concrete. You have to chip that concrete out. You have to repay, which brings the street up a little bit, the elevation, and then you have to pour new concrete. So it's it's a little more complex than I think most people recognize. Exactly. Uh, there's quite a bit of work, again, in preparation for, and then afterwards, we have to go back, like you said, and, and reset those manhole covers so that we can access the, the uh, equipment underground. That's going to be exciting. And then Farmer's Market, of course, is on Green Street. So the listener might think, whoa, how's that going to work? We're uh, coordinating well with our contractors, with our public works crew, with Mariana for Farmer's Market. So rest assured, Farmer's Market on Green Street throughout the summer but you will be, you know, throughout the city of Tehachapi, there's going to be construction zones like it is every summer because we can't do much during the winter when it comes to new construction because temperatures have to be right. You can't have freezing temperatures, those sorts of things. But uh, it'll be safe, and we encourage you to continue to shop downtown, to visit the farmer's market, to, to visit all of the businesses in downtown. Don't be afraid to come down. Absolutely. The Green Street and Davis, that work is a relatively short duration work, you know, it'd be a, a day or two. So you'll get plenty of notice on that. Everything will remain open. There will not be anything shut down. Or and there'll like be that. access to all the businesses yep. unfettered. So it'll be complete 100% access. This is something, another project that I'm super excited about is slurry sealing some of the city streets, Andrew. So we're going to be spending you know, quarter million dollars or more actually maintaining or slurry sealing uh, a bunch of city streets. So why don't we talk about the boundaries within that project? Sure. Maybe we talk about what justifies the boundaries first. And so slurry seal itself is a preventative care for asphalt that's in 
relatively good shape. So it's newer neighborhoods. It's stuff that's not so aged. It doesn't, it doesn't provide any structural section, meaning a car rolling over it. It doesn't provide any strength. What it provides is a lot of solar protection and essentially fading. And so your slurry seal coats typically target stuff that's not over maybe 10 or 15 years old. So it's a preventative thing, not structural like repaving Green Street. So some of the neighborhoods that we're targeting on the slurry seal coats are the Orchard Glen neighborhood, Autumn Hills, Blair Ranch, and the Clearview neighborhood. So if somebody were to call me and say, my city street is just coming apart, why didn't you slurry seal it? What you just said is the answer. So we, it, we want to maintain or save asphalt before it deteriorates to a point where we have to spend a lot of money and actually repave it. So it's a dance between budgets, personnel. You know, the state of California will tell you, you know, oh, we've, we've got tons of cash, billions and billions and billions of excess. Well, I'd love them to send me some money so we can repave some of the city streets that they've been promising us cash with SB1 and all sorts of, of dreams that don't come true from Sacramento. But we have a super limited budget when it comes to maintaining and repaving we just so happen that we're uh, we have really talented individuals in house that we're able to, you know, apply for certain grants, budget really well, plan really well, and we're doing a lot of work this year. But so super excited about the slurry seal project. I, I would equate that slurry to uh, similar to your car. The paint on your car, if you don't apply a wax to that periodically, the the paint is going to deteriorate, get faded, uh, eventually peel off. So you wax it occasionally, right? It's the same with the pavement. You need to go and you apply a slurry seal. It's like a, it's a seal. It, it helps extend the life of the asphalt. That's a lot of the issue that we've had. The streets, particularly in downtown, because that's the oldest part of town, is that there has not been that preventative maintenance. So now we have to go and do a full-on rehabilitation of it you know basically tear it out and replace it and so we kind of have two things that we're trying to achieve here one is a complete rehabilitation and replacement as well as a preventative maintenance so we kind of have projects for both and obviously it's a juggle to try and split your money where where you can get it there's grant funding for for different types of things, so you, you're limited in that respect as well. And definitely, as you said, Don, the the preventative maintenance is far more affordable in terms Good of dollar point. a linear foot than than waiting to rehab something. You know, listeners out there, if you think, oh, it's it's why not rehab more? Is is you know for the same two hundred thousand dollars, you can do you know all these neighborhoods versus two city blocks repaving. It's yeah, literally in the neighborhood of like one tenth the cost to do the preventive maintenance versus a complete rehabilitation. That's a big deal. You know, doing that preventative maintenance, adding life, you know, that's, that's one of those things that, you know, it's nice to hear that we've got that on the board. We've got this category. Let's add life to our streets. These streets need to be in a different condition, need to have different attention. And, you know, of course, then you've got the new projects that take place, but, you know, we've got these different categories and you look at it with a balance and say, okay, we need to make sure we extend the life of these roads, these neighborhoods. So that way, all of a sudden you don't have everything in a rehabilitation state. Yeah. There are streets in town that are savable, that are still in good condition and can be (laughs) done, but there's, there's a lot that aren't. And, you know, slurry sealing a street that's half dirt does no good. Well, we run a business at the city of Tehachapi, similar to private business, quite frankly. We don't make a widget and sell it, but certainly we have revenues that come into our coffers, and then we spend that money on planning personnel and and asphalt, in this case, we're talking about today. And it's really important to balance our books, to make sure that we're planning well, and that we spend the dollars correctly. So super proud of the team, the way that we've been accessing funds, planning for different things, long-term visions and and really getting things done today's conversation is a true testament to the quality of people and the quality of product that we're putting out and that we have been putting out for some time now super proud of the team with a slurry seal project is that something that we do in-house or is that something we have to seek outside from our public works yeah we use contractor for that specialized equipment to lay the 
emulsion. It's essentially a gravel and oil mixture that they have to lay down at a certain thickness. Sounds like a tough job. I mean, honestly, a hot heat, really the coordination of doing that. It's like roofing, hot, hot mopping a roof. Is that kind of equate to that? Similar. Yeah. This yeah. Is, again, it's the science that's involved. Yeah. You know, and that's one thing I keep learning through these podcasts is the science. There's there's reasons that we do things a certain way, and it's about having quality, you know, adding the life to it. And it's about having people like Andrew, these engineers that understand things in a different way that I do. You know, I look at something and I'm very visual. Oh, no, Keith, you and I are normal. Right. These engineers think inside of a square it, box, right? It, I'm giving them a hard time all the time. I'm like, dude, you need to be like, think outside the box. <laughs> but I, I see Andrew, you know, he, and he's able to, you know, because Andrew's office is right next to mine. So we, we get a chance to have a lot of conversations when we do. He's able to explain things in a using different terminology that I wouldn't even think would oh, be involved. Oh, thank God for Andrew and Don, honestly, yeah, it, because I can't think in the box. <laughs> yeah, but obviously, they get together and they're able to have these conversations that they understand in their right. engineering language. We just have to ask, can yeah. you give us the translation on that? Right. Well, let's move on. So we have uh, some sidewalk projects on the north side. We've been installing sidewalks, building sidewalks for the last several years with CDBG money, Community Development Block Grant money which is low to moderate income funding source that we can utilize. And we awarded a contract to a contractor to put in additional sidewalks in an area that was never, it never had curb gutter sidewalks from the very beginning. Correct. Yeah. He's redoing, I think, three blocks just north of H Street. Mm-hmm. Sidewalks going in. It's interestingly enough, pretty much a one man band. Mm-hmm. So the contractor. Well, good for are, him. Yeah. yeah, good for him. And the people that live there, they never had a sidewalk. So I'm sure that they are super excited about curb, gutter, and now sidewalk. And and we're improving the public infrastructure, which hopefully enhances the safety area of, of that, that area that they live in for their children, maybe. And then they'll start to improve. And we've seen houses on the north side improving, right? Bringing up property value. So super excited about that whole process. I think that's a great project also, there's a lot of kids in that neighborhood, you know, walking to school. It's much better accessibility for them, for people to walk downtown. So the the look, the feel, the accessibility, the safety of it is is a great improvement. And then it goes beyond the kids too. I mean, with it, we have a lot of seniors. Sure. And then seeing them with, you know, the, that they're out being mobile, but they're, you know, they've got something to assist them, you know, whether it's the walker or they're, maybe they're in a wheelchair. And, and to see them have it, accessibility. I mean, what a key word that is that we identify, you know, areas where we can help enhance accessibility for all. Right. And you see it when, you know, if you stop, if you just stop and pay attention, sit down and watch, you start seeing the pedestrian traffic. And there is a lot of pedestrian traffic that takes place on both sides of the tracks. But particularly, I notice it on the, on the north side where I see a lot of seniors. There was, you know, the other day I was coming into town, I got off the freeway at Love's and was coming into town from the east side. There were 13 separate individuals on either bicycles or walking on that that path that we put in a couple years ago. I was super excited to see that. And they were they were recreating. I could tell they weren't going to work or anything, but they were utilizing that path and getting out of breathing fresh air and doing things that we need to do more of. So super excited about that. Speaking of that path, Greg, I, Urban Greening is a project that we have out to bid right now, and that, that'll further enhance. It's for 500 trees around town, but about 300 of them are going to line to Hatchby Boulevard and, and to be able to give them a little bit of respite from the sun and the wind. So we're going to plant. So this is a project, the Urban Greening, which is the tree grant project. We've been talking about this for a little bit of time, uh, a year or two. And, you know, it's, again, we've got to do a lot of planning. We receive a grant. We didn't get the money, but we have to plan it, Right. We have to work with the state for selection of trees. We have to design an irrigation system, all those sorts of things. But we're going to be planting 500 trees on the boulevard. It's 300 on Tehachapi Boulevard. There'll be Curry Street median south of Pinion. Mm-hmm. Those, those medians will be um, landscaped and irrigated with trees also. I think that one's about 30. And then kind of the next biggest one would be Valley Boulevard where we did the road narrowing a couple of years ago, that one will have, I think, another 60 trees or so. That's so cool. 
That's so cool. So we're creating this this urban greening project, right? Right. More trees and more trees for public works to maintain. To maintain. <laughs> there you go. You can you can easily build it, but you got to maintain it, right? We're gonna sharpen but, up our chainsaws. There you go. <laughs> ready. So when we have a project like when we did the Valley Boulevard and, and uh, those improvements along Valley between Curry and, and going west, do we look to the future about looking for like the urban greening? grant so it's like we got it's like phase one you know if you will and then the you know that is another part that's coming in the that we're going to add the the green to it at a later date and then now we've got the pedestrian crossing that's going across on mill do these are these all in like a master plan and we have to check them off phase one phase two phase three or do we just kind of identify areas of need or where we can incorporate things i guess based on grants when they become available the answer is yes so, you know, you'll remember several years ago, we updated our general plan, right? That's the playbook for how we want the city to look and feel when we grow up and mature. We don't want to be Bakersfield, Lancaster, Palmdale. No offense to them. We want to be to Hatchapi, right? And how do we want to look and feel? And so we've master planned the, the different streets, the extension of different streets and roads, the bicycle paths, all those sorts of things. Obviously, Money and and grants come into play and changes are made as appropriate. But yes, things are master planned to the point that we can. Yeah, the grant funding is a little more amorphous on that end and and applying them. But as Greg said, there's also within the master plan, a bicycle master plan. So all, you know, they were hired to identify where the bike path should lay out through town. And the urban greening happened to be a good fit for a lot of the bike path sections because they, they shade the bike paths themselves and that's part of the carbon sequestration and, and heat island effect and, and some of those things. So you're able to then say, oh, we've got this open space next to a bike path. Does this particular grant make a lot of sense? And and so you're combing through grants and spending quite a bit of time looking at grants to see how they fit. And I would say a fair percentage of the time you look at them and it's like, ah, oh, that doesn't, we either don't think we can be competitive enough or that doesn't quite fit the Tehachapi look and feel, so we won't apply for this one. And so you do spend quite a bit of time looking. So we're, we're trying to master plan a city that's already built. When the planners developed Irvine, for instance, they had a clean slate of paper and, you know, 10,000 acres, whatever it is, and they were able to master plan that city or that region. Tehachapi, we had a beautiful town and we have growth around it. So we have to integrate those two and figure out how we can make best use of the space of you make it safe as, as possible and integrate you know new with the old so it's really exciting kind of like the antelope run bike path we have an amazing partnership with attached becomings county water district they own that drainage channel but we have a bike path that goes through there so we maintain don maintains the path the uh, attached becomings maintains the drainage basin but we're going to be putting in more trees in that path also. And so many people use that path. You could actually walk all the way from the Warrior Park in the Alta Estates area all the way to Walmart and then connect going east into the Freedom Plaza into the Golden Hills area. It's quite amazing. And that didn't happen by accident. Right. Yeah. So we're putting in 70 trees over there that Don gets to maintain on top of probably the 100 he has already on Antelope Run. And so it is. And in, these are awesome relationships to be able to have with the local county water district, HP Cummings County Water District, where, you know, we have the trees, we have the bike path and, and you guys have your drainage and, and, and we'll all make this work. It's all public owned space. So why not? It helps me understand a little bit more not getting to work within the departments is, you know, as intimate as you guys are in the work. I'm still like the public, you know, sitting out wondering how did that come together. We got to get you caught up to this stuff, Key. You, that's right? what we're oh, doing that's right what now. Podcast. Okay, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> and so one one project that we're actually working on right now, as we speak, Andrew, is the enhanced pedestrian crossings up by Tompkins Curry Street and then on Valley. Can we talk about that a little bit? The chaos that started, what was it, May 3rd, when school the school's first yeah, day back in session, like, oh, yeah, we, and the contractor decided We started decided the project, and then the school district decided to open Tompkins. We're like, the same ah, day. We're, we can't keep up. It's it's a product of COVID, I guess, So, but we worked through that. We did. Of course. And, and just so the public knows, that's absolute coincidence. Yeah, the public <laughs> might think, why the heck did they start a project when school opened? Well... That wasn't the plan, and and we are obviously way smarter than that. So, <laughs> yeah. So that project is a uh, 
two two minor sections around town. You're crossing Valley at Mill Street. We identified that one as a high foot traffic area tying into the Valley multi-use path. And then same is is crossing Curry Street at Tompkins Elementary School. So that was a uh, highway safety infrastructure program grant for enhanced pedestrian crossings. And so it'll have, we'll have perimeter flashing lights similar to what the stop signs are in downtown on Hatchby Boulevard, and they'll be push button activated. So not a stop sign or a signal, but if you're a pedestrian, you can walk up to this crosswalk and push a button, and then a tree of lights will illuminate caution lights, alerting the vehicles that you're getting ready to cross that street. Yep, absolutely. Okay. And it'll be in, also the striping will be higher visibility. And then in front of Tompkins, it's a raised median refuge. So if people are coming down the street, you actually have a midpoint where you can stop if you're crossing. The That'll street. make both of those areas a lot, a lot safer. And then Don, you've got to maintain them, right? Make <laughs> yes, sure the lights yes, are flashing and they're, are they solar or is that, uh, how does that work? Correct. Yeah. So part of our city standards update includes the TAPCO lights. And so all of part of the maintenance of this and planning with Don is, is we agree on, Hey, the city likes this product. It works well up here. Okay. Instead of having 10 different flashing light systems we we've agreed on one and so that's what we spec out and so it is it is solar powered battery operated and they sync via radio yeah very good i was just thinking about something key so you know when we maintain we maintain so much but and we have daily weekly monthly inspections but the public is out there every day and we have a process where they can alert us and help us help them when it comes to maintenance. So if you see a light out, if you see a pothole, different things, you can let Dawn know immediately if you go to text my gov, right? Which is 661-441-3844. And you can be prompted and help us help you keep this city as safe as possible. Always you can email, you can call us, but we want to make sure that everything is maintained to the highest quality that it can be. Isn't that right, Don? Absolutely. And we appreciate uh, and and take these reports very seriously and we address them as fast as we can. Um, you can also go to our website too, by the way. You can go to our website and there's a way you can go through and, and request or, or report a pothole or water leak or or something else not working, traffic signals, those kinds of things. Yeah, whatever works easiest for you on our website at liveuptohatchby.com, we have our request tracker. And then you can put in whatever the thing is that needs to to be repaired or your concern, whatever it is, and it'll go to the correct department. The nice thing with the the text to City Hall using 661-441-3844, we send you the link to that website page. So if you're mobile, you're out on your phone, you text. First, you want to text hi, H-I. Now you're in the system. Then put in whatever the, the problem is, pothole, sidewalk, leak, whatever you see, and then you will get the correct form sent to you just by that one word request. And then it'll go to Don's department. So that way the leak can be addressed or the, the broken sidewalk or whatever issue it is. That's the nice thing that we've implemented recently. We have about 130 people that have already subscribed that are in the system that are starting to use it. So Yeah, you know, we have a couple billion dollars worth of infrastructure in the city of Tatchby that the city owns. And there's a lot to maintain, and we take it very serious. But the public owns this infrastructure, and we want to make sure that we're maintaining it to the highest quality, and we really need your help to alert us. If you see something, don't let it fester, because that is going to cost us, you, more money later on. We want to get on it as soon as possible. Yeah, I always tell people uh, with regards to irrigation and landscaping, you know, it's a it's a big job for you to maintain the landscaping around your house. It, I have a front yard and a backyard and there's sprinklers and plants and it it's a f- big job to maintain all that. Well, multiply that by about 10,000 and that's what we have here at the city and we have really about six full-time people that that's all they do is uh sorry, not full-time. We have two full-time guys and about four part-time guys. That's all that they do is landscaping maintenance. And they're so dedicated. They it, do such a great job. And we have, speaking of maintenance, we have a program key that we're going to be unveiling here for yards, right? Our our, our city uh, improvement program. So I know that you're working on that and maybe we can do a podcast. We'll obviously do a, a press release at some point in the future, but we're really excited to honor people that have been maintaining or have refreshed their landscaping 
in their front yard. Even though we're in a drought situation, that, that doesn't mean stop watering. That doesn't mean stop maintaining. It takes very little, if no effort and or, not effort, a lot of effort, but no money to maintain yards. So we want to honor people that are, that are doing the right thing. Exactly right. That it's something that people work hard and, and they should be acknowledged for their hard work and what they do to beautify their property helps their neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. So this is a, something that we've developed and we're putting the final little touches on it that if you, you can, uh, you'll be able to nominate a neighbor, you know, or you can say, Hey, take a look at my property. You can nominate yourself. And then we'll go out and take a look and say, yeah, we've got these beautiful signs that you can put in. It says to hatch, be beautiful. Uh, just a nice colorful logo that you can put in that you've been acknowledged as being one of those key stakeholders of your neighborhood, yeah. you know, and that's, it's neighbors acknowledging neighbors. And it'll be about uh, just, yeah, I think it's, it's going to be a cool little program that uh, I think city council will get behind as well. Yeah, I do too. Well, this has been a great conversation. I appreciate Don and Andrew's time this morning talking about all the different projects. Of course, we have little projects that come and go, and, and there'll be more throughout the season. And I know that we have, we're going to be talking to Ashley Whitmore, our airport manager, about some projects and operations at the airport. But on the airport, we have a taxiway relocation. We have some drainage improvements, fuel storage improvements. So we can talk about those capital improvements with her in the coming days or weeks and, and talk about the airport and how it's operated. It's a general aviation airport. So really looking forward to that conversation also. It, it's going to be a good conversation because we hold events out there as well. Mm -hmm. And as COVID is starting to uh, work its way, work its course of letting us become a little bit more normal, we'll start to see events take place. The first one we'll have is the July 4th fireworks, which is done right there on the, uh, the taxiway or the runway mm -hmm. of our airport. So, and that's coming up. We've got the rodeo that's going to talk to us. We've got some great shows in the queue. This one, again, I'm learning more things about the city that I didn't know was things that took place that uh, in order to make things happen, there has to be conversations within our organization with different departments. Communication is key, right? It is. It's the, they always say it's the, either the key or the key thing for success or breakdown in relationships. And here we've got different departments talking to each other about how they can work together to benefit our community. Couldn't agree more. Key. The key to communication. <laughs> key. <laughs> well, Don... Andrew, anything that we didn't uh, talk about you think that might be important that we, we notify the, the community? You touched on a lot of things. We, we did. We did. But really, I want to emphasize, be safe. Slow down for the cone zone, if you will, right? Yes. That's a Caltrans statement, but it's, it's true, right? You don't, want to, you don't want to harm yourself or anyone else. All businesses will have 100% access. Please just do the right thing and, and bear with us as we improve your infrastructure. So Don and Andrew, thank you very much for joining us. So we, we really appreciate your time that you took away to share here with the community uh, right here on Tehatchpot. So guys, thanks a lot for joining us. Thanks thank you so much. And, uh, you know, Greg, again, you know, we keep learning more and more. I know you, you're you right in the middle of all of this. I'm, I'm not. I'm a little bit removed a layer or two. So when I get to a chance to include, you know, Andrew and Don, and they start to talk about the things of how we do business, it is an eye opener for me. I mean, I think you're involved in it, so it's not quite the eye opener, but me as the public, it's like, there's so much that gets involved in order to get something done. And then we think about, you know, the future of it, the longevity of it, you know, and being, you know, responsible with the money that's involved to get these projects done. It matters. And it's, it's, uh, it matters because it's, it's important to have a solid infrastructure because that's what the public builds upon, whether it's you're raising a family or you're, you're operating a business. If we don't have the proper water system, the sewer system, the, the rubbish system, you know, all the different things that we operate and maintain, you know, uh, Mayor Smith and Susan Wiggins and Joan Pogancourt and I and Christina Scrivener went to the Chamber of Commerce uh, dinner on Saturday night out at Stein Springs. On the way back, we were talking about infrastructure, and I told him I feel such pride when I come into the city because we are we are improving on every corner of the city, right? Everything that we do, we do it with purpose, and we do it we do it well, quite frankly, as a team, and it just it shows. 
it shows and super proud of everyone. Well, we'd like to throw out to the audience that if today's conversation answered questions, then that is exactly what our goal was. But if it brought up a question, maybe something that uh, we didn't ask either Andrew or Don, you know, about, you know, projects and how they take place and you have a question, send it to us at media at TehachapiCityHall.com. We'll get that question to Andrew or Don or whoever needs to address it, and we'll get an answer for you. That's media at TehachapiCityHall.com. Don't forget to sign up to text directly to Tehachapi City Hall, and you can report your concerns and, and problems, things that you see, and you just simply text the word HI, H-I, to 661 441 Three eight four four. Keep that phone number in your contacts as texting to City Hall, and we'll be able to uh, directly get information to you that you need. And we appreciate your time, Greg. Thanks for joining us today. It's been a great conversation. Thank you, Don. Thank you, Andrew. Folks, make sure you follow us. We appreciate the time that you spend with us on these conversations. This is To Hatch a Pod, and we'll catch you again soon. To Hatch a Pod is a conversation about Tehachapi designed for the people who live here or who would like to know more about this mountaintop community. If you have a question you would like answered, email media at TehachapiCityHall.com. We will try to answer it on a future episode of To Hatch a Pod.